Now, according to science, when you physically die and when your brain stops functioning, that is it. That is the end. That's the end of consciousness. One day in the summer of 2002, Martha Copeland of Lawrenceville, Georgia, played back a sound recording she'd made earlier that day and heard the voice of her daughter, Kathy, disciplining her dog. That wouldn't have been so unusual, except that six months earlier, Kathy had died in an auto accident. In September 2005, Vicki Talbot of Bellingham, Washington, received a message on her answering machine from her son, Braden. Braden had been dead for over four years. In January 1994, Mark Macy of Boulder, Colorado received a telephone call. The caller identified himself as a European psychologist named Konstantin Raudeva. This is Konstantin Raudeva speaking. Dr. Raudeva had been dead for 20 years. One day in October 1987, Claude and Ellen Thorland of Sweden switched on their TV. Suddenly this strange image appeared and they quickly snapped it with their Polaroid camera. Only later did they learn that their friend Friedrich Jurgensen, a pioneering afterlife researcher who had died a few days earlier, was being buried at that very moment, 250 miles away. For more than a half century, people throughout the world claimed to have communicated with the dead using instruments of modern technology, such as tape recorders, radios, telephones, computers, and video systems. They call this phenomenon Instrumental Transcommunication, or ITC. I think the reason that they choose to communicate with us like this is because this is the electronics age. This is what we accept. The structure of the human voice. In recent years, ITC has increasingly captured the attention of serious researchers, including doctors, engineers, and physicists, as well as scientific investigators of the paranormal. It has given rise to books, scientific reports, and international conferences held on both sides of the Atlantic. What's really going on here? Mainstream science tells us that nothing survives the death of our physical bodies. But that doesn't stop the flow of whispered voices, images, and verifiable information that seems to be flooding in from what some believe to be human minds inhabiting another dimension of existence. Is it possible that materialistic science has been misinterpreting the nature of human consciousness and therefore dismissing valid evidence for the conscious survival of physical death? Science is a method of inquiry, not an ideology. And at present there are many scientists who believe in materialism, but this is really a belief structure or a philosophy. And science as a method of inquiry doesn't have to be committed to a particular worldview. Science appears to preclude the possibility of an afterlife, but science evolves and there's no knowing what possibilities may be acceptable to a future science. After 26 years of doing research and investigation in this field, I've concluded that there's more than enough evidence that there is life after death, that we survive our bodies' deaths. The notion that hard evidence for an afterlife might be staring us in the face may be a stretch for most scientists. But that hasn't discouraged many respected researchers from studying such phenomena as near-death and out-of-body experiences, reincarnation, mediumship, and instrumental transcommunication. At the grassroots of this growing movement, practitioners around the globe claim to be conversing with the deceased through the most common and accessible form of ITC. It's known as the electronic voice phenomenon. A brief definition of the electronic voice phenomenon, or EVP as we call it, would be the existence of voices of unknown origin which appear in tape recordings particularly, but could also be recorded in other ways. When I first heard EVP, the EVP that I produced and I knew was real, and not just something that people said, it changed my whole life in that I then really wanted to devote 
my work and what talents I have to researching this thing. Electronics engineer Alexander McRae lives on the Isle of Skye off the coast of Scotland. A leading expert in voice communication systems, he developed speech enhancers for the space shuttle and voice links for the London Underground. When he first heard about EVP, he was convinced it was an alarming fraud aimed at exploiting the vulnerability of the bereaved. I'd had a high-level security clearance in the UK and the US, so, you know, I'd been into some quite fancy things, but I didn't believe this. With his expertise in speech communications, he started recording EVP in an attempt to discredit it. And then one evening, to my great surprise, with some equipment I was developing at the time, I heard a voice. My reaction was um, not fear, but something close to it. I, you know, I was really startled. McRae was even more amazed when he discovered additional voices on the same tape. The first one was actually my father's voice. And uh, what he said, I mean, I recognized the voice, what he said was a typical phrase that he used. He used it so much, in fact, that it became his nickname. So I became reasonably convinced that this was the electronic voice phenomenon that people had been talking about. After 25 years of research, McRae is one of the world's leading experts in EVP. What my research has convinced me is that there is another dimension to our existence, and that includes life after death. EVP was apparently first noticed in the early 20th century, when unexplained messages were said to have appeared in telegraph, telephone, and early sound recording systems. As communication technologies developed, the idea of using them to contact the souls of the departed fired the interest of a number of well-known scientists and inventors, including Alexander Graham Bell, Nikola Tesla, and even Thomas Edison, who proposed building a device to capture spirit voices. In 1939, Attila von Soleil, an American photographer, claimed some success at EVP using a phonograph record cutter, and in the 1940s with a primitive wire recorder, a precursor to the modern tape machine that recorded sounds on spools of thin magnetic wire. In 1952, while editing wire recordings of Gregorian chants, two Italian priests, Agostino Gemelli and Pellegrino Ernetti inadvertently picked up the voice of Gemelli's deceased father. Because traditional religious strictures forbid communication with the dead, the two fathers feared that they had committed a mortal sin. But they were greatly relieved when Pope Pius XII declared the recording a major discovery, one that might lead to new scientific studies for confirming the existence of an afterlife. Then, as tape recorders became popular in the 1950s, people reported hearing mysterious voices in their recordings. At first, no one took these strange intrusions seriously, and they were dismissed as the random pickup of stray radio broadcasts. The first person to research EVP in depth was the Swedish artist and filmmaker Friedrich Jurgensen. In 1959, he was using his portable recorder to tape nocturnal bird sounds for a documentary. On playing back the tape, along with the sounds of the birds, he was amazed to hear faint voices discussing nocturnal bird sounds. Convinced that he was recording messages from the dead, Jurgensen devoted the rest of his life to researching the phenomenon. He went on to record thousands of voices in several languages, established that they often interacted with the experimenter, and published his findings in several books. One of Jurgensen's pupils and collaborators was the Latvian psychologist and philosopher Konstantin Raudova. 
After working with Jurgensen, he too became convinced that EVP was the dead speaking. Raudova worked endlessly to persuade scientists and the public that with simple recording equipment it was possible for the dead to speak to the living. During his lifetime, he recorded 70,000 voices in six different languages and published the first book on EVP in English. In 1971, he released this phonograph record to promote his book. The voice then calls the experimenter's name, Konstantin Raudive. The experimenter states that in his opinion, man cannot grasp the events after death with his intellect. A voice replies in German, er kann. He can. In another recording, the experimenter remarks that people do not believe in life after death, and a voice answers, so sind sie. German. That's how they are. Raudova's voices triggered interest across the world, and especially in Europe. German physicist Ernst Senkowski was an early EVP experimenter. I began in 1976, and after the second or third test, I immediately got voices saying, we are the dead, we are alive, we are able to think and to speak. I am one of uh, more than 1,000 German persons engaged in communication experiments with the so-called dead. Well, one of the first extraordinary voices I received 14 days after I started was the voice of my late father. And he addressed me with my nickname he used when I was a little boy. In the U.S., Sarah Estep was EVP's leading pioneer. She made hundreds of her own recordings and published her own groundbreaking book, Voices of Eternity. In 1982, she founded the world's first organization devoted to the study of EVP, the American Association for Electronic Voice Phenomena, now known as Association Transcommunication. Today, the organization is based in Reno, Nevada, and is directed by Lisa Butler, a psychologist, and Tom Butler, a communications engineer. The function of the association is to provide objective evidence that we survived death. It is also a community of researchers and people that are just interested in the phenomena. After reading Estep's book, the Butlers became fascinated with the possibility of recording voices of the deceased. Following Estep's instructions on how to obtain EVP, they soon began to get results. Hearing the first EVP was absolutely amazing. I don't think I slept for three nights. Like many who experiment with EVP, the butlers discovered that some of the voices were familiar. At the end of the recording we said, is there anybody else that would like to say something? And here was this voice that I recognized immediately as my mother. I immediately recognized it as being her mother's voice and I understood exactly what it said. Uh, the importance of that is just unspeakable. When I heard it for the first time myself, I was actually first a little unnerved and then there, as an electronic engineer, there was a task of trying to figure out how could that possibly be occurring? Where could the voices be coming from and how would they be in the electronics? So the rest of my life, I guess, I'm going to be spending trying to answer those questions. Probably the main benefit of EVP is solace to the bereaved. I think the highest thing that EVP can do for anyone is help through the grieving process. Um, you don't have the person in the physical, but a relationship can continue. 20-year-old Kathy Amos of Lawrenceville, Georgia, often called Cat, was a bright, lively young woman. Though badly mauled by a dog as a young child, she recovered fully and never developed a fear of dogs. 
Indeed, animals were one of Kathy's passions. Following a serious car accident from which they miraculously escaped unharmed, Kathy and a cousin of hers made a pact that whoever died first would try to contact the other. Unbeknownst to her cousin, Kathy had been studying the electronic voice phenomenon. Tragically, within a month, another auto accident claimed Kathy's life. Five months later, while surfing the internet, Kathy's cousin discovered EVP for herself and implored Kathy to speak through the computer. Suddenly, she heard a whispered voice. Soon, Kathy's mother, Martha Copeland, was recording her own messages from Kathy. Many of Kathy's messages seemed to reflect her love for animals. One day, as she often did, Martha switched on her recorder at home and went out shopping. When she returned, Kathy's dog had made a mess of the house. When Martha checked the recording, she heard Kathy's voice admonishing the dog. A similar incident produced the following EVP. After searching the internet, Martha discovered the AAEVP and joined immediately. Soon she was sharing recording tips and EVP samples with Karen Mossy of New Hampshire, whose son Rob had died of a brain injury. Rob, it's missing you, <laughs> Before long, other names and voices began to show up in their recordings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The name Braden popped up repeatedly. I know, great. <laughs> but neither Martha nor Karen knew anyone named Braden. Only later did they learn that Vicki Talbot of Washington State had lost her son in a kayaking accident and had just joined the organization. Her son's name was Braden. Braden died on March 11, 2001. He was 20 years old. Uh, he was with his best friend Jim, who was also 20, and they were out kayaking in Bellingham Bay, and they just never came home. One of the members said that they had gotten an EVP two weeks prior to my joining that said, it's Braden. Braden had already joined this group that I had subsequently joined, and that he was just waiting for me to join. <laughs> then I thought, well, if he's communicating in that way, I'm going to actually try this. <laughs> When I started receiving messages from Braden, my whole grieving process took a turn. Certainly I continued to grieve, but there was this sense of excitement. To actually hear from him just thrilled me beyond belief, and I knew then that there was the possibility that I would continue to hear from him. Happy birthday. One of the first messages I got from him was, Again, him saying, Mom, very clearly twice. He's just as funny as he always was. What do you know that I don't? One night when I was feeling very sorry for myself, I recorded a message from Braden saying, Sorry, Mom, but I lost everybody. Sorry for being crabby. And that gave me a whole new perspective. You know, they miss their family and their friends, and they love them. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Braden continues to come through on the answering machine occasionally. And last October, one of his friends called, her name is Rachel, and uh, right before she begins to speak, he calls her Sweet Pea which was a term of endearment that we used for each other and for his friends. Hey, Vicky, this is Rachel. And then after she hangs up, Jim says she has hung up. Before long, this core group of Vicki Talbot, Martha Copeland, and Karen Mossy expanded into its own national organization, whose members record every other Thursday and share the results over the Internet. 
They claim that their children on the other side have formed a group they call the Big Circle, which their parents on this side have adopted as the name for their own organization. Members say they often receive messages from the children of other members, suggesting that they had found one another and are teaching each other how to contact their loved ones among the living. If somebody came up to me in the street and said, there's nothing paranormal about EVP, I would say, well, I believe in experimental evidence. I've done at least 20 years and hundreds of experiments, and I know that it is a paranormal effect. Now, how many experiments have you done? Skeptics insist that there's nothing paranormal about EVP. But are these dismissals based on a genuine understanding of the phenomenon, or are they simply expressions of unscientific prejudice? Let's take a look. One of the most common skeptical explanations for EVP is pareidolia, the tendency to see patterns or hear meaningful words when in reality none exist. Is it possible that EVP is just misidentified noise? That may be true of some EVPs known as Class C, which are often quite indistinct. But according to Alexander McRae, even Class C EVPs can be successfully verified by the use of voice prints. You create a voice print of the EVP utterance, and then you say the same thing as you think is being said in the EVP utterance. So you now have two voice prints, and you just visually compare one with the other, and if they match, you're correct. Another way to understand Class C recordings is to work with panels of experienced listeners. You uh, tend to find that the consensus will be among experienced listeners or trained listeners. Let's say uh, they were ships, radio operators, people like that, who were used to listening to difficult sentences. Yet another way to make Class C samples more intelligible is digital filtering. And finally, some Class C recordings may be inferred by their context. The previous EVP, for example, was received when Dr. Konstantin Radova attempted to contact the deceased Russian poet Vladimir Mayakovsky. EVP samples in Class B are more intelligible than those in Class C, and most listeners usually agree on what they say. And Class A samples are crystal clear. One's earthly journey. One's earthly journey. So while some EVPs might be the product of projection or wishful thinking, pareidolia fails as a blanket explanation for EVP. Another skeptical claim is that EVP practitioners are simply unaware of other people's voices in their environment, which on playback they mistake for EVP. However, EVP is usually recorded in very private circumstances. It has also been received on recorders from which the built-in microphones have been removed, as well as personal computers and other equipment, such as Alexander McRae's device, that have no microphones, and therefore cannot pick up any natural voices. Background voices can also be positively identified by the use of a second recorder. Curiously, the same EVP will not show up on more than one recorder at a time so any sounds picked up by both recorders can be ruled out as EVP. By far the most common skeptical claim is that EVP voices are nothing but the random pickup of stray broadcast signals. But EVP researchers point out that recorders can pick up radio signals only under very rare and limited conditions. They also cite many other reasons why the radio pickup theory falls short. The fact that most EVP occurs in short durations is also evidence against the theory that it is radio pickup. If the phenomenon of EVP was just a random event, then you'd be as likely to get very short phrases and very long ones, say, 
um, half a second for some and two hours for another. But no, they all tend to cluster round about one and three quarter seconds in length. It's like you are standing on one side of a river and on the other side there's another person and you are just calling hello. And then the contact breaks down. Does this short time window help explain why so many EVP communications seem to be phrased in a sort of poetic shorthand? One of the most obvious and consistent characteristics of EVP phrases is that they are whole statements. They begin with the first word of the sentence and end with the last word of the sentence. And that is against all probability of just being a chance event. And that does indicate that somebody is trying to communicate. And then there is the fact that you don't pick up music normally, but has a lot of broadcast output in this country and elsewhere, consists of music, you know? So it was just straight pick up, where's all the music? People who practice EVP often discover an apparent interactivity between themselves and the voices recorded. She asked if there was anyone that wanted to speak, and there's a voice. It's if radio pickup were the source of EVP, this would be astronomically improbable. It'll answer questions that you ask, it'll respond, make comments about things that you're doing. We were in a location that was supposed to be haunted, and it was very dark. I had turned on a pin light to see if the recorder was working. When we listened back to the tape, we were very surprised to hear this voice. Another aspect of EVP interactivity is the frequent appearance of pet names, nicknames, and other private information known only to the deceased and to relatives or close friends. Uh, one example occurred with a Scottish physicist called Archie MacDonald, whose wife had recently died. Her name was Margaret. Now, we made a recording, and he said he heard a message from his voice, and I analysed it at home. And I said, sorry, Archie, it's from somebody called Molly. He says, ah, yes, but that was a pet name that I had for Margaret, his wife. And that, to me, was really good evidence. I didn't know that. If I recognise the voice, the manner of speaking, the context that the speaker is, is speaking in, the, um, the remarks that are made which are pertinent to my life or perhaps what I've been doing or sometimes even what I'm thinking, to me, that's evidence enough. Further evidence against the radio pickup theory comes from the fact that EVP almost always presents itself in the language or languages understood by the experimenter, regardless of the location. If you record it in another country where it's not an English-speaking country, but all you understand is English, you will record English EVP. I took the device to Spain, I used it in Spain, and from my background I know that you can't receive any radio broadcasts in English, certainly not in that place at that time you couldn't do that. And so any pickup should be in Spanish, but it wasn't, it was all in English. Radio broadcasts tend to reproduce the human voice fairly accurately. But forensic analysis shows that typical EVP voices do not originate in a human vocal tract. Instead, they seem to have been synthesized in ways we don't yet understand. My department is involved in the, the analysis of EVP and ITC phenomena. Just Paolo Pressi is an industrial engineer and a founding member of Il Laboratorio, a research organization based in Bologna, Italy, dedicated to the scientific analysis of instrumental transcommunication and EVP in particular. Pressy and his colleagues have pushed the envelope of rigorous scientific research on EVP, using state-of-the-art electronic instruments and forensic software to analyze EVP voices. Pressy says that determining the origin of these voices is beyond the scope of his laboratory work, but that their structural analyses point to a distinctly paranormal origin. Some researchers, like Alexander McRae, have built their own equipment to test the validity of the radio pickup theory. With my system, 
there's a local transmitter which drowns out all the other radio broadcasts. They just do not record. Even though this system completely eliminates the pickup of broadcast signals, McRae is still able to record EVP. Determined to test the radio pickup theory once and for all, McRae traveled to the United States. I took the device to a laboratory in California, and this laboratory was shielded against radio waves and also against sound waves. So inside the laboratory, you couldn't pick up anything. But yet the device still produced voices. The final recourse of the skeptic is simply to declare EVP a hoax. But there's no actual evidence for this as a blanket explanation. On the contrary, there seems to be an abundance of scientific evidence in its favor. And hoaxing seems to be an extremely unlikely motive when so many individuals have been obtaining results for so long and virtually all have shunned publicity. There are also huge odds against grassroots EVP practitioners having the expertise to electronically synthesize the voices that appear in their recordings. Researchers say that the final argument against hoaxing is that you can try EVP yourself. Since the method of obtaining EVP is technically simple, testing its validity can be done by anyone. To find out whether something is genuine, you have to do it yourself. Because then you do not depend upon believing other people. There's no guarantees you're going to make the contact. There's no guarantees that those on the other side will want to make the contact with you. But on the other hand, maybe they will. And in most cases, they probably will. So try it. Try it for yourself and see what you get. Researchers and practitioners stress that EVP is not difficult to achieve and that you can begin with an ordinary cassette recorder and some brand new tapes that have never been recorded. Use whatever you've got available. Don't go out and spend a bunch of money. But if you don't have something that records, this is a basic setup. Uh, this is an analog recorder. It's very inexpensive. It has analog buttons. It makes it easy when you find an EVP to go back and listen to it again. It has a counter on it. The counter allows you to note where the EVP is. With the cassette recorder you want to use a standalone microphone because the internal motor of the cassette recorder is noisy and will cover up your EVP. You always want to use a set of headphones. Usually in the beginning the voices are very soft so the headphones help you hear the soft voices. Many EVP practitioners report that these digital memo recorders are especially effective at capturing EVP voices. Some practitioners skip the recorder entirely and record directly on their computers using readily available audio software. You can record EVP anywhere. When you're starting out, we would suggest that you pick a spot and start recording at the same time each day and in the same spot. It's kind of like they know your intention by doing that. We would suggest that you ask a question and then you simply give those on the other side time to answer back. You tape this for a short time, maybe a few seconds, maybe a minute, and then you stop recording, you play back, and you listen to that what you find on this tape. You need to listen very closely in the beginning. Usually the voices start out as merely whispers. It's interesting, after you do this for a while, the voices will actually become louder and become stronger. With EVP, you actually have three things going on. You have the individual, you have the spirits on the other side communicating, and you have the device in which the communication comes through. We feel like the individual and the spirits on the other side are the most important parts of the circuit. The equipment seems to be the least important. Some practitioners prefer dim light to calm their minds and minimize distractions from the environment. 
Others find meditation to be helpful in clearing their minds and focusing on making the contact. Researchers say that some EVP voices seem to be formed out of available background noise. So the chances of getting clear EVP in quiet environments can sometimes be enhanced by adding a small amount of broad spectrum background noise. For example, from a white noise generator or a small electric fan. The three most important points when uh, doing EVP research are one, to keep to the same time of day as far as possible, keep a regular appointment almost. The next one is if you have an emotional bond with the person you're trying to reach, then that does help an awful lot. And the third one is to communicate yourself. Don't just sit silently, ask questions. If you do that, you can double the number of responses that you get. When the phenomena expanded into pictures, faxes, uh, computer messages, actual phone calls, another term had to be coined, and that became instrumental transcommunication, or ITC, which basically means communication through instruments. Technical writer Mark Macy of Boulder, Colorado has been one of America's foremost investigators and advocates of instrumental transcommunication. He has written and published several books on the subject, and his website, worlditc.org, is a rich source of ITC history, lore, and information. He has performed his own EVP and ITC experiments, and has traveled widely, giving lectures and presentations. And they try to modulate those sounds into a voice. In October 1995, a colleague in the small European country of Luxembourg sent a message to Macy that purported to be one of many that had appeared on her home computer. As with the home tape recorder in the 1950s, the advent of the personal computer in the 1980s and 90s gave rise to claims of anomalous messages that seemed to appear out of nowhere, often on simple machines that had no connection to an outside network. This message, addressed to Mark Macy and one of his collaborators, claimed to be from an obscure journalist named Arthur Beckwith, who was born in England in 1832, was married in Jamaica, and eventually settled in Brooklyn, New York. He died the same day the Titanic sank in 1912. I hired a private investigator in England to uh, look up the records of Arthur Beckwith in that area, and Arthur Beckwith turned out to be born in 1832. Arthur mentioned in his letter that he was employed by the Sun and the Brooklyn Daily Eagle and the Citizen. So I went to the public library in Brooklyn, New York, and we found out that sure enough, Arthur Beckwith was employed on those newspapers, and we found his obituary. A colleague of mine went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. The census records showed that Arthur Beckwith was a 68-year-old widower in the year 1900, living at 150 Skirmerhorn Street in Brooklyn. Arthur also mentioned a man in his letter named Bill H. Lynch, who had been a rector at St. John's Roman Catholic Church in Lambertville, New Jersey. So we went to that New Jersey church and sure enough we found a record of William Lynch who was a rector at that church at the time. Do people actually receive phone calls from the other side? In the 1970s, two veteran parapsychologists, Scott Rogo and Raymond Bayless, set out to answer this question. After investigating numerous cases across the U.S., they concluded that phantom phone calls were not only real, but also surprisingly common, estimating that hundreds were received every year in the U.S. alone. As with other forms of ITC, people claim that they clearly recognize the voices of deceased friends and loved ones. 
Physicist Ernst Senkowski is among several researchers who claim to have received phone calls from the dead. In 1976, while working at his home in Germany, he claims to have received a call from video ITC experimenter Klaus Schreiber, who had been dead for several years. He came through with his voice on my telephone, and it was the absolutely clear voice of Klaus Schreiber. And I was, for a moment, astonished. And then I said, Klaus, uh, do you allow that I record it? And he said, yes. And then he said, please give my greetings to Rainer Holbe, with whom he co-worked already during lifetime. And to the people in Luxembourg, they will be very glad. And then, Klaus, I ask him, did you ever try to get in contact with other people? And he said, naturally. Klaus, hast du versucht, dich manchmal über Radio zu melden? But I have here somebody who wants to speak to you. And I give him the device. And you hear something like rattling. And then a Roman Catholic cardinal came through. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Here Augustin Lund. Augustin Lund. And I was dialoguing with him, and he quoted a sentence which my late father used when he had some struggling about the National Socialists. He was not a man of any party, but he did not like them. And he used a special sentence from his home country, Eastern Prussia. And this was quoted by this cardinal. And he said, I know your father. He told me, and then came the sentence. It's a very nasty sentence. Literally translated, it means, I cleaned his stomach. What does it mean? It means, I told him the truth. Your father, I know him. He said to me, he had the people the mouth rein. Yeah, that's what he said. But I never used it. My wife did not know it. My children did not know it. My father died in 1959. And there is no one who is able to use this sentence and send it to me via telephone. My wife was listening downstairs. So it's not my hallucination or my illusion. It has been taped by the answering machine and witnessed by my wife. So there is no way out, believe me. This is reality. And if somebody, maybe the greatest scientist, refuses to take it, it is his problem, not my problem. Sorry. There's actually a tradition of ITC researchers passing on, going to the other side, and then contacting researchers on this side. According to many ITC researchers, the undisputed champion among afterlife communicators is the Latvian-born experimenter Konstantin Raudeva, a psychologist, philosopher, professor, and author who spoke a half dozen languages and died in 1974. There are literally scores, possibly hundreds of people who received his voice through electronic voice phenomenon. And he's spoken dozens of times through radio and telephone. The 
It was a spring morning in 1992 when I received my first telephone call from the other side, from Konstantin Raudeva. Mark Macy had been preparing to conduct an ITC experiment involving very low-frequency radio transmissions. According to Macy, the caller identified himself as Raudeva and offered advice regarding his experiment. He had no way to record phone calls at the time, but he was prepared when the caller rang again. Hello? Yes. I'll try to make it clearer this time. It's a VLF receiving converter. Okay. You'll simply connect the VLF converter to your HF radius antenna input and a suitable VLF antenna. The conversation lasted for several minutes. The caller's voice was clear as a bell, and his advice regarding Macy's experiment was sophisticated and technically impeccable. These conversations weren't limited to technical advice. They often touched on human social issues and suggested that the insights provided by ITC might lead to a more just and peaceful world. You know how dangerous the acts of all kinds can be. Violence. That's one of uh, those things we want to prevent by ITC. The violence. For the past half century, instrumental transcommunication has generated keen interest among practitioners and researchers worldwide. International conferences held in the United States and Europe have drawn ITC experimenters, scientists, engineers, psychologists, and medical doctors from around the world who share their experiences, present the results of their research work, and discuss methods for better understanding the nature and meaning of ITC. One such conference was held in 2004 in the bustling port city of Vigo, situated on Spain's Atlantic coast. The conference was co-sponsored by a local development bank and by the locally published ITC Journal. The keynote address was given by the city's vice mayor, who's also a medical doctor. We are living constantly with physical death, and yet there is always the underlying enigma as to what happens after physical death. Sometimes the information is information that adds to our body of knowledge and even predicting. Those phenomena have been with us for a long time and we have, by mistake, thought of them as paranormal. This first division of sounds into different auditory types can be settled on the discrepancy between the periodic and the aperiodic vibrations. The conference was directed by Dr. Annabella Cardoso, a career diplomat who is a successful ITC practitioner and publishes the ITC journal in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. I got introduced to the subject by a couple who had lost their only son in a sailing accident here in the Bay of Vigo, who requested my help just in the sense of speaking with them about any possibility of life after death. We started after having been to Madrid to speak with a, a Jesuit priest who is quite an authority on the paranormal. And he said, well, my best suggestion for you is to try instrumental transcommunication. So I just started experimenting and I got such important and uh, relevant results that naturally the study of this discipline is very important to me. J'ai perdu ma première épouse à Nick en 1988. Speaking at Dr. Cardoso's International ITC Conference, Jacques Blanc-Garin explains that he lost his first wife in 1988. In 1992, after discovering EVP, he and his present wife, Monique, founded an organization known as Infinitude, Infinity, which links over a thousand EVP practitioners throughout Europe. The organization's main purpose is to help the grieving connect with their loved ones who have passed. They also publicize EVP, train people in its use, 
and provide networking opportunities for practitioners in France, throughout Europe, and beyond. They also promote research into EVP and ITC aimed at improving the quality of the results. At the Vigo conference, the Blancarans presented some of their members' EVP samples. For several years, Dr. Annabella Cardoso conducted successful EVP sessions at her home in Spain. Her library includes hundreds of tapes that document the results of her experiments. In 1998, during an EVP session, Dr. Cardoso was using one of her older radios to provide white noise for an EVP experiment. Suddenly, out of the radio came a direct response to one of her remarks, spoken in her native Portuguese. Dr. Cardoso says that these voices have often called her by her childhood nickname, Bella. They always called me Bella. Bella was my child's name. I am Annabella. My family, still today, they call me Bella. Since DRV voices come out of radio receivers, couldn't stray radio broadcasts be the source of these apparent communications? I would say to the skeptic that stray radio emissions do not reply to you when you ask who is speaking. Stray radio emission will not tell you it's your brother Luis. I mean, that's nonsense. The theory that direct radio voices are in fact the dead speaking is strongly supported when they are clearly recognized as those of deceased friends or relatives. Marcella Bacci of Grosseto, Italy, is the world's most successful practitioner of DRV. Since the 1940s, Bacci has been picking up the voices of the deceased on old vacuum tube radio receivers. Over 60 years later, his radios continue to produce copious voices in a variety of languages that thousands of people have sworn are those of their loved ones and can engage them in meaningful two-way conversation. In this 2002 documentary produced by Italian Swiss television, parents of deceased children bear witness to the voices received through Bacci's radio. <laughs> Marco, ciao, ti abbraccio. E quindi lo squarcio di azzurro che abbiamo avuto è stato notevole. Ha detto, mamma Milena, ascolti Massimiliano. E quindi se io avessi avuto dei dubbi quella sera proprio me li sarei levati tutti perché nessuno mi conosceva. In over six decades, Bacci has never charged for his services or accepted a single donation. Scientists and researchers from around the world have investigated Bacci. Engineer Paolo Pressi and his colleagues from Il Laboratorio have been investigating him since 1974. To date, no one has ever found the slightest evidence of fraud. The voices that are coming from uh, out of his radio are very astonishing because uh, the content level is very high in respect of the culture of Mr. Bacci because he was only a businessman with a shop of washing machines, radio and so on. <laughs> Despite nearly four decades of accumulated evidence, some skeptics still insist that the voices could be faked by transmitting them from a remote location. 
But repeated scientific analyses have ruled this out and have also established that the voices themselves are highly anomalous and do not originate in a human vocal tract. From my point of view, is the top uh, expression of uh, instrumental transcommunication. I know him in 1974, and uh, I frequently visit him in Grosseto. In 2004, a group of afterlife researchers, including Dr. Annabella Cardoso, Professor David Fontana, Robin Foy, and physicist Mario Festa, joined engineer Paolo Pressi for a session at Bocci's center in Grosseto. Initially, the voices emerging from Bocci's radio spoke in Italian, but then Bocci reminded them about his English-speaking guests. Senti, ci sono anche degli inglesi, degli amici, che vengono da molto lontano. I'm sorry, Bocci. I'm sorry, Bocci. <laughs> <laughs> David, yes. Ciao, David. Ciao, David. <laughs> I say, I say, ciao to you. Can you speak to me again in English, friend? David Fontana. Annabella Cardoso. Thank you for all your hard work. Congratulations. È un fatto medianico, una cosa che c'è sempre stata. L'uomo l'ha sempre avuta. È un regalo che ci hanno fatto per vedere chi siamo, che però non si è sciupato tutto come si è sciupato la nostra terra, si è, si è inquinato tutto noi. In the late 1800s, practical photography had become a reality and was soon to be accepted as an art. In this somber photograph made in 1858 by Henry Peach Robinson, a young woman is seen on her deathbed. But its artistic value lay mainly in its being the world's first photo montage, in which five negatives were combined seamlessly to form a single image. But art soon gave way to opportunism and opened a Pandora's box brimming with alleged spirit photos that were arguably or patently fraudulent. Techniques included multiple exposures, multiple negatives, and even primitive hand drawings and paintings. The alleged spirit faces and figures were depicted with a naive literalism, displaying none of the softness or subtle distortions seen consistently in the most convincing examples of visual ITC. Often the original photo had been pre-composed to allow for the insertion of these alleged spirits. Though some early spirit photos might have been legitimately paranormal, by the close of the 19th century, photography and fraud had truly become a marriage made in heaven. Fast forward now to the mid-20th century, when electronic photography, in the form of television, became widely available. EVP pioneer Friedrich Jurgensen was among the first to recognize its potential as a means of communicating with the departed, and often predicted that images from the other side would soon appear on television screens. Jurgensen spent his later years in the southern Swedish town of Hur, and died in October 1987. At the exact moment of his burial, his friends Claude and Ellen Thorlin, who lived about 250 miles to the north near Stockholm, experienced a strange phenomenon. According to Mrs. Thorlin, she heard an inner voice prompting her to switch on her TV and tune it to an unused channel. As she did so, the screen went dark. Then a spot of light appeared which grew into this image. As if to fulfill his own prediction, 
Jurgensen had apparently projected a fair likeness of himself onto the Thorland's television screen, which they captured in this Polaroid photograph. But Jurgensen was not the first to produce images of the deceased on a television screen. That honor probably belongs to Klaus Schreiber of Aachen, Germany. In his youth, Schreiber had experienced deep poverty. Later in life, he suffered the loss of eight close relatives, including his beloved daughter Karin, all within the span of a few years. Though plagued by ill health himself, he maintained a positive outlook, and in 1982 began experimenting with EVP. In one communication from a deceased relative, he was advised to try working with video. Today we take video recording for granted, but in the 70s and 80s it required clumsy, expensive videotape equipment. Trained as a saddlesmith, Schreiber understood little about this technology and at first was unsuccessful. But following further EVP advice from the other side, and with some help and encouragement from electrical engineer Martin Wenzel, Schreiber constructed a video feedback loop, which produced highly unstable forms that he was told could be manipulated by those on the other side. By 1984, Schreiber's perseverance paid off, and he began to receive many remarkable images. By laboriously advancing his tapes frame by frame, Schreiber was able to isolate and study these single images or short sequences in which the pictures would often emerge from random shapes. Since he had no means of editing his tapes, he simply re-photographed these clips onto a second videotape to preserve them. Some of Schreiber's video images were of unknown individuals or groups, but others were recognized as prominent figures, such as King Ludwig of Bavaria, Albert Einstein, Cistercian abbot Alois Wiesinger, German actresses Hildegard Schaefer, and Romy Schneider, whose image we can see developing in this sequence of video frames. Not surprisingly, Konstantin Raudova himself made several brief appearances on Schreiber's video screen. But most intriguing of all were the images Schreiber identified as deceased relatives, including his grandfather, his mother Katerina, his sister Maria, a cousin of his, his son Robert, who died at age 22, his deceased wives, Gertrude and Agnes, and his daughter Karen, who had died at the age of 16 after a difficult illness. Could all these images have been hoaxed? During a broadcast discussion about ITC on Luxembourg television, here's what German engineer Martin Wenzel said about Schreiber's work, as translated by Dr. Ernst Zinkowski. Mr. Wenzel, it is in the nature of man, and it is good so, to be basically skeptical. Then one is able to inform oneself, and yet remaining skeptical, one may research. You controlled Schreiber's equipment and wrote a report Yes, when Klaus Schreiber published his first images or presented them in the public, he invited me to visit his laboratory and observe everything, how he is working. He revealed everything. I could check anything down to the smallest cable. There was nothing hidden in any way, and I had to see that he worked without any tricks. It's only a very unconventional way to use a video camera. In January 1988, 
following a second heart attack, Schreiber passed away, and within a few months apparently began communicating with his colleagues on Earth. Afterwards, apparently Klaus Schreiber sent an image through the transcommunication station in Luxembourg. And this image appeared in a computer system. So it was digitized, and it is clearly to be seen that it is Klaus Schreiber. Rivenich, Germany, was the site of numerous ITC experiments during the 1980s and 90s. Here, Dutch TV personality Tineke de Noy interviews Rivenich experimenter Adolf Homus. Ich habe mir, ich habe Jürgensen kennengelernt damals in meiner Anfangsphase meiner sogenannten Forschung. Ja. Und äh, habe das Buch von Jürgensen. Homus' early work focused on EVP and direct radio voice, which produced, among others, the following communication. Then, working with colleague Friedrich Malkoff, Homus began experimenting with an old television set that had no connection to an antenna. Eventually, the experimenters received several striking pictures, including this one, of Anne de Guigné, a young French girl who died in 1922 and is now venerated by the Catholic Church. And this one, of Elisa Carolina Homus, Adolf's mother, who had died shortly after his birth in 1935. According to Homus and Malkoff, in numerous EVP contacts, Elisa had been serving as a communicator for an ITC contact group that was working from the other side to contact practitioners on this side. Vicki Talbot reports that late one night in July 2006, her television set turned itself on and off several times and displayed various black and white scenes of people asking to engage in two-way conversation with her. She says that in her astonishment, and in the dark, she was unable to find her camera in time to capture this sequence of events. But she did eventually manage to snap one picture of the TV image, showing several youthful faces, before the episode ended. Here it is with some of the distortion removed, and here with some of the noise removed. Vicky says she now keeps her camera close to her TV set at all times, just in case. No account of visual ITC would be complete without mentioning Robert Vandenbroek, who lives near the tiny village of Hoven in the Netherlands, where he grew up. Since early childhood, Robert has displayed a remarkable range of unusual talents, including the ability to consistently predict the appearance and location of crop circles and occasional snow rings in his area. American crop circle researcher Nancy Talbot has been meticulously documenting his abilities since 1997. In addition to his other talents, Robert has consistently obtained a stunning variety of anomalous images on both film and digital cameras. These have included likenesses of deceased individuals, such as astronaut Neil Armstrong, crop circle researcher Paul Vige, John Lennon, activist filmmaker Aaron Russo, medium Edgar Cayce, and even the noted skeptic Paul Kurtz. These images have appeared on dozens of visitors, researchers, and journalists' own cameras that Robert has never previously seen or touched. In an especially remarkable sequence of images, Nancy Talbot's late brother was depicted in 60 different variations on two separate afternoons in daylight, 
with Robert using Nancy's own camera under her close scrutiny. When we visited Robert in February of 2014, we brought two video cameras to test and document his talents. A small one was set up on a tripod to cover the scene, with the main one supported on a body brace. To preclude any tampering or substitution, we brought our own still camera, which had no built-in memory, and we used a distinctive type of memory card that had not been manufactured for at least five years. We numbered each card in advance and erased it in full view of the video cameras prior to every test. Yes, okay. In all of our tests, Robert stood in front of a dark blue curtain in his small living room in approximately this position. At the end of each test, he handed the camera back to us and we placed it on this coffee table to unload the memory card into a password-protected laptop computer. The camera, the computer, and all the memory cards remained visible to us at all times. Here are some of the images that appeared under these conditions. In one image, the outline of a face appeared in what looked like a flash of light. No, something? What was that? This is strange. I don't know. I don't know what it uh. is. In this one, a curious energetic swirl resolves into an apparent human hand. Whoa! Oh my god! Oh my goodness, this is, this is very clear. It looks like Friedrich Jorgensen. Most intriguingly of all, two distorted images appeared that resembled Friedrich Jorgensen in his later years. Robert states that he is not the source of any of these anomalous events. Instead, he says he has always been aware of, and increasingly a conduit for, what he often describes simply as an energy, from which he also claims to receive information. In the incident seen here, Robert suddenly looks up, as if his attention were being drawn to an unseen presence. Then he immediately turns toward our second video camera, just as its exposure system is being anomalously influenced, presumably by this same presence. At no time during this incident had anyone touched this camera, which had never before misbehaved in this way, and has not done so since. Uh, the screen was going black a little bit. Was it? Yeah. Huh. It was, was going dark. Oh. And then light, I don't know what it means. Most EVP contacts through sound recording devices are brief and are more like simple calling cards than detailed messages. As we've heard, their clarity and their fidelity to a deceased person's actual voice and mannerisms may vary, but many do seem to be a convincing match to a person's natural voice and tend to be reasonably consistent over time.
With Visual ITC, these calling cards tend to show up in cameras and video systems as symbolic or representative images. Some of these are believed to be direct mental projections from the other side. Others appear to be modeled after photos or other sources that exist somewhere in the world. With some exceptions, this tends to result in a clearer and more easily identifiable image of the deceased. Skeptics tend to view this as evidence of hoaxing. But a closer examination reveals many subtle differences, including whimsical distortions and creative embellishments that would have taken significant time and expertise to produce. So it seems quite a stretch to believe that these can appear fully formed and seamlessly layered into a brand new digital photograph within a matter of seconds, in a borrowed camera, with a blank memory card, under close observation. So dismissing them as simple trickery without taking the whole picture into account seems unscientific at best. Let's consider Robert Vandenbroek's images of astronaut Neil Armstrong, which appeared during a test session in 2014 that was closely monitored by two video cameras. Here's one of Robert's images, and here are some frames from an obscure 2011 New Zealand TV interview with Armstrong. They're a close match, but there are also some intriguing differences. For one thing, Armstrong's left ear has become transparent, with the frame of his glasses showing right through it. While the mouth remains prominent, the eyes have been reduced to bland, colorless surfaces. Some parts of the anomalous image are streaked or feathered, while some are not. Throughout the test session, the camera remained firmly autofocused on the background. And since nothing unusual appeared in the viewfinder, any possible trickery would have had to take place during the one second blackout period in which each photo was taken. In any case, no trickery of any kind was observed by the second camera. Some of Robert's images of Aaron Russo also appear to be modeled after an existing photo, but are even more dramatically sculpted in ways that would have taken some time and skill to accomplish. And they too appeared within moments, in full view of filmmaker William Gazecki's video camera when he visited Robert in 2010. Oh, check that out. That's totally him. Absolutely. That is totally him. Oh my God. He has closed his eyes. And in the series of photos that's apparently based on this picture of Nancy Talbot's late brother, Every image is artfully and often whimsically varied, though they all bear a consistent signature in the form of this mask-like shape and radically stylized ear. Could these effects be produced using photo manipulation software such as Photoshop? And if so, could they be produced under the same conditions in which they actually appeared in Robert's photos? We don't know because, to date, no one has succeeded in replicating them, under any conditions. Other examples of visual ITC display their own characteristic types of distortion that would have been impossible to achieve without a considerable investment of time and costly professional expertise, especially prior to the release of Photoshop software to the general public in 1990. Here again is the image of Friedrich Jurgensen that was said to have appeared on his friend's television screen at the exact moment of his burial. In addition to the rudimentary formation of the eyes and a low camera angle never before seen in photos of Jurgensen, it displays a key anatomical distortion, a grossly enlarged ear. These oddities would seem to be pointless to include in a hoaxed image and would have required the services of a talented graphic artist back in 1987, three years before the introduction of Photoshop.
The reality of ITC is strongly supported by the practice of physical mediumship, in which the surviving consciousness of deceased persons is claimed to produce various effects in our physical world, including sophisticated interactions with our audio and visual technologies. In physical mediumship, phenomena happen of a physical nature, meaning objects move, things appear, disappear, things that people can see happening. There's an effect on real objective things. For a closer look at physical mediumship, let's travel back in time to the late 1990s in the tiny English village of Skoll, where the most extensive and long-running experiment ever attempted in afterlife communication unfolded over a five-year period in the darkened cellar of this 17th century farmhouse. The Skoll experiment was the brainchild of two veteran afterlife researchers, Robin and Sandra Foy, who worked closely with two of Britain's most accomplished mediums, Alan and Diana Bennett, and what they claimed to be a corresponding team of experimenters on the other side. During their 500 sessions, all of which were recorded on audio tape, the Skoll experimental group went into a meditative state to connect with their other dimensional counterparts. The goal was to collaborate in devising and conducting experiments that could produce tangible physical phenomena, which could then be studied and analyzed objectively. Robin Foy's remarkable 550-page book, Witnessing the Impossible, chronicles each of these 500 sessions, many of which were observed by visitors, eventually totaling in the hundreds, including top-tier scientists and engineers. The experiment was also monitored by three experienced investigators of paranormal phenomena, electrical engineer Arthur Ellison, research psychologist David Fontana, and veteran researcher Montague Keane. All sorts of things have happened, particularly in this 20th century, which earlier generations would have said were impossible. Skeptics are often unaware of the amount of experience and the amount of knowledge that goes into investigations of this kind. Between the three investigators, you could say we'd had 50 years and more of experiences of this kind. We know all the tricks. Initially, we were all pretty skeptical because what had been claimed seemed so way out. The Skoll experiment was reported in contemporary magazine articles, two books, a 400-page scientific report, and a full-length documentary film. Its successes included nearly a thousand hours of direct communication through the mediums, and an impressive variety of intriguing physical phenomena such as tiny animated lights that flew around the room. The Skoll group also witnessed what they claimed to be the spontaneous appearance of physical objects. Perhaps the most astonishing of these objects were these newspapers, which arrived in mint condition, despite having been published in the 1940s. We took it to the leading research station in the world on paper and printing, and it was absolutely clear from their report that this was a genuine article which appeared 50 years after the event, and no one has been able to explain how it got there. In other sessions, a video camera loaded with brand new blank tapes and switched on in a darkened room produced an amazing series of colorful abstract frames. The tapes also contained unexplained light phenomena and enigmatic faces. A conventional 35mm film camera placed on the table in their darkened room initially produced a series of black and white images that the Skoll group were told were faithful duplicates of existing photographs from around the world. Some were photos of existing photos and they said initially that was easier for them to do before they went on to photos that had never existed. Continuing photographic experiments using isolated rolls of film and no camera were carefully controlled by the independent investigators. We would buy the film ourselves. Uh, we would load it into a box, 
The box was held in the hands of the investigators so that no one could get at it. And then immediately afterwards, we would take it out of the box ourselves so that no one else touched it, and then develop it ourselves in a special machine. To everyone's surprise, these films revealed a stunning variety of content. This included whimsical drawings and symbols, diagrams, writings and poetry in multiple languages, as well as portraits and signatures of known individuals. The Skull Group also heard voices through a tape recorder from which the microphone had been removed. They also recorded voices that apparently came directly out of the air, most often that of a British engineer, Reg Lawrence, who claimed to have died in 1942 and possessed a special talent for this type of communication. Here's another actual recording made at Skoll, in which Lawrence responds to a question from visiting engineer Walter Schnitger. Do you see any possibility to describe how you can get the air to vibrate that we can hear it with our ears? We do not speak. We think in a language we are familiar with. Yeah. And by some miracle, I have to say, <laughs> this bed up here, I'm transported into your room. Yeah. Not by me, but by those whose job it is to do that. These discarnate communicators often demonstrated that while their physical bodies may have turned to dust, their sense of humor had not. You all right over there, John? No. No. Shut your eyes. Yeah. Yes. Think of something very nice. No, no, not that. <laughs> <laughs> How do I know that the phenomena come from the afterlife rather than from the mediums themselves? We simply have clues of information which was extremely unlikely to have derived from the mind of the medium. And the more impressive those are, the more likely it is it's an aspect of discarnate communication. The second-rate scientists would say, well, uh, this uh, so-called paranormal phenomenon cannot have occurred, and therefore it must be conjuring. It must be uh, stage magic. Well, uh, that is not my idea of good science. It's not possible to dismiss the excellent evidence quite so readily. I could not do it myself as a professional magician. And I don't believe in any magician that uh, I knew could do this. I'd say they were wasting their time doing this here for nothing, when they could be earning <laughs> a million dollars out there on the stage. If you take all the phenomena within the whole of the Skoll experiment over two years while we were there, I would say that the possibility of fraud and faking was nil. These things are so extraordinary that when one tells them to people who've not had the experiences themselves, they think oh, it must be trickery. And the challenge then always is, okay, you duplicate it. ITC is only one among many branches of afterlife research that are slowly but surely making their way into the mainstream of science, academia, and general public awareness. These disciplines challenge our materialistic preconceptions about the nature of consciousness 
and their findings seem to point unanimously toward a more complete, meaningful, and multidimensional view of our existence, one that extends beyond our normal experience of time, space, and matter. I think the fact that we survive bodily death is a scientific fact. It's nothing to do with religion. This isn't evidence based on faith. It's objective evidence. So it has changed our lives completely. We should be devoting enormous social resources to this question, not leaving it up to a matter of belief. Maybe it's a superstition. Maybe it really happens. The only way to find out is to study the phenomenon and find out whether it happens or not not to adopt the view that it's a superstition and then close off any inquiry. That way we find out nothing. We remain trapped in our belief system. The experiences that I've had have convinced me that it is very difficult to explain any of these things by an alternative explanation to that of survival. I think the skeptics regard the possibility of the survival of human consciousness as inherently so impossible that anyone must be rather crazy to believe it. But when you look at the evidence, you have to ask yourself whether you'd be even more crazy not to believe it or to find some alternative explanation which makes any sort of sense. And I haven't found one. The way that I see this uh, subject developing, and it is going that way already, is to get into the universities, to get accepted by the mainstream. Then money will come in and qualified people will come in and they'll be able to do this as their work and the rate of development will increase enormously. The more we understand about consciousness, the more we understand that it is a continual stream, that sometimes we are having the experience of consciousness within the physical, and sometimes we're not, but that consciousness is continuing anyway. It makes you take personal responsibility too. Um, we know that we continue to grow on the other side, so you want to do everything you can here to live by the golden rule. If the world at large knows that when you die, it isn't oblivion, that this would have a beneficial impact on the way that people live their lives. ITC really convinced me that life goes on after we die, and in the big picture of my life, it allowed a huge sigh of relief. Now that I knew that life was eternal, I could relax and breathe more easily and tread more lightly on the earth. I'm just back up there. I'm just back up there.